Welcome to Battling Adventures Radio. I'm Sean Rowley, and with me, it's Derek Spesh. Hello. What's happening, Derek? Not much, man. Not much. It's uh, it's getting close. It's is it? It is spring. It's, it's we're in spring, summer yeah. now. Well, we're getting there it's eventually. It's getting warmer, but then it gets colder. It's right on the cusp. Yeah. Cusp. Were you paddling on the weekend? I saw your uh, your canoe rack on your truck. No, I was just too lazy to take it off from oh. when, when oh. I was paddling. Yeah. Um, wait a minute. <laughs> you don't know if you paddle on the weekend or not? Hey, wait a second. What day is it here? It's no, like no it was me. It's the ninth. Yeah, no, no. No, I just... <laughs> <laughs> It's 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 going on summer, so it just stays on now. Yeah. <laughs> Unless I need a car wash. <laughs> uh, I am going through post-solar eclipse withdrawal. <laughs> withdrawal? Didn't you really have to see it in the first place for to uh, have withdrawal? I saw the eclipse. I had FOMO. It, 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 no, it was FOMO, and then it ha- actually did miss out, and now it's like a, you know... What was FOMO? Fear of missing out. Oh, no, no. I did not have fear of missing out. I saw the eclipse. How did you see it? Those those dark clouds, they eclipsed the moon and the sun. <laughs> <laughs> it the just cloudy, locked it all the out. The cloudy sky got darker. Right? Oh, it got really, it, it got dark like as if there was a big thunderstorm. Coming, yeah, 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 yeah. Right? And it came and then, in quick and left. Yeah. Yeah. And what was wild is, uh, so we just stayed in our yard, and uh, and so we knew it was coming. We knew we were only in the 99.9% area, and so it did get dark for about uh, 30 seconds, maybe 45 oh, yeah. seconds, and then it passed. But we were in the very top edge of the, of the, of the black dot, whatever, the... The, the, of the eclipse. The totality? The totality. So what was neat is that when we looked north, it was very bright sky. But yep. when we looked south down over the lake, it was a very dark sky. So you could see that they were in shade. Now, I saw pictures of that uh, NASA sent out, a video. Oh, the Hubble? Of, from, no, uh, of the ISS. They took video from the ISS. Okay, I haven't seen that. The one. ISS passed right through, so the ISS went through the dark spot himself. And Ooh. and you could see this moving mass. It's, so you ever see, what is it, Star Trek where Vulcan is... Uh, the red matter goes into the Vulcan planet oh, and it sucks yeah, it up. Yeah. So <laughs> in the picture from NASA, it's like, oh, is there a black hole sucking up the Earth? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so it was kind of neat that way. But yeah, we did uh, We did get to, we, we sat out in the yard and uh, and watched it go and it got dark and then got light and, and it was over, but it was cloud cover. Oh, there was a slight hole in the clouds. And so for just a few seconds, we saw the sliver of the uh, of the eclipse it was just we couldn't even use the glasses it was so dim so mm-hmm. we just looked at it it's like oh my eyes are okay but it was so dim i don't <laughs> think it, it really hurt us but yeah I, I did set up my i set up my work cell phone and my home cell phone one in the front yard one in the backyard and and i just pointed them at the sky and thinking yeah my home phone is old my work phone is my work's phone so it's like if the <laughs> if anything gets burned out, I don't care. But <laughs> uh, it but the so you know, I look at the video, and uh, the the like, the cell phone totally compensated for the darkness. So y- if you look at, do you know how you can pull up the video and see all frames? Yeah. So you can see it darken in the middle and they get bright again. But when you watch it, you can't tell. There's no. It's like. You got to hey, put it on uh, rid- lock- time adjust. Yeah, or like, what do you lock the white balance or lock something? Yeah. So eh. <laughs> anyway, so I wasted my time setting up my cameras in the yard. <laughs> I knew when it was happening. I knew th- I was not going to see it. Mm-hmm. And when it got dark, I was busy walking to Shoppers Drug Mart to go buy shampoo. <laughs> <laughs> what do you need shampoo for? My beard. <laughs> <laughs> the dog. <laughs> oh, dog shampoo. <laughs> uh, and as they got the post office and the shoppers drug mart. Oh, okay. Had to go mail some stuff. Yeah. But yeah, no, I, once I saw those clouds, I'm like, that's typical for us. Any yeah. astronomical event, clouds, guarantee, 100%. Yeah. 
if if it was a sporting event <laughs> that I could bet on, I would bet on clouds every time. <laughs> Are you going to see the comet, the meteorite, oh, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the the aurora borealis? Are you going to see it? It's no clouds. It's, it's funny, eh? Like I I have this sort of the same experience. There's so many things that it's like, hey, it's a really big aurora this night. We're going to see it in southern Ontario. It's like, um, I see clouds. Yep. So it, it happens to me all the time too. It's a cloud eclipse again. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. East, west, and south of Toronto were able to see it, apparently. Yeah. Uh, I just saw the, the clouds. Uh, so Tracy and Ariana went to the Royal Botanical Gardens in Burlington. Cool. And it cleared up just enough that they could actually see it. Oh, nice. Right? And the other thing is, is they were there to see all the flowers in the Botanical Gardens. So mm-hmm. even if they couldn't see it, it wasn't a lo- loss of a day. Yeah. Where you're seeing people, I spent, you know, $1,000 on a hotel room for a night <laughs> to see the eclipse and I couldn't yeah. see it. Yeah. Well, you pays your money, you take your chances, <laughs> right? I saw an interview on like CBC because there are people going, oh, what about my pets? What about my animals? What about the birds? And so, and so they were interviewing some guy at a, at like at a zoo or something. It's like, what are you guys doing to take care of your animals? It's like, um, the animals aren't stupid like people. So <laughs> it's not like my dog was concern. sitting there pointing at the sky going, Hey, check this out. <laughs> yeah. Actually the, but the, there were a couple of zoos and I think Toronto Zoo may have been one of them. They were actually getting people to watch the animals at the zoo mm-hmm. to see if they noticed anything weird or yeah, yeah, different yeah. behaviors yeah. happening. Well, the animals would think nighttime's coming. Oh, I got to find a place to settle down for yeah. the night or do whatever or yada, yada, yada. So <laughs> they just lay down for a night and then it's time to get up again. Yeah. Wait a minute. I didn't feel like I slept at all. I don't feel rested. <laughs> do not feel rested. That was such a short night. <laughs> uh, for those that got to see it, that have never seen one before. Like my daughter's never seen one before. Mm-hmm. Right. So, you know, it's nice for them to be able to see it at yep. least once. Uh, there's so many photos from so many different places uh, of of the the eclipse i personally am very disappointed in the lack of zombies and alien abductions <laughs> that were linked to the event i don't know why none people of are it, talking about that none of it happened for those that were expecting the rapture oh yes better luck next time it either didn't happen <laughs> you got or rejected. you got rejected <laughs> one of the two i better didn't luck make next the rapture time. cut yeah <laughs> I, I don't know, and that's somebody. Somebody posted something about eclipses happen around the world everywhere, mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah, but how come only in North America are they prophetic? I know, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, We're special. I've heard a lot of people. That it was know. like, uh, it, it's a sign from God to repent, and it's like, no, it's an astronomical phenomenon. It happens all the time. <laughs> Zombies, alien abductions. That's all I'm saying. Disappointed. <laughs> Nary a one to be seen. I did hear from- As far as I know. I, I haven't heard from some of my friends today. That's true. Is anybody missing? Yeah. <laughs> I think maybe once we're done recording, I may have to make a couple of phone calls. Yeah. Hey, uh, yeah, yeah. Is, is, is Jim there? <laughs> I haven't seen him since yesterday, you say. <laughs> yeah. Flash of lightning wasn't there, you say. <laughs> Yeah, I saw some of the pictures that people posted, and some of them are fantastic. You can oh, see, huge, you can yeah. see the the sort of the whatever the solar flares, there's or some whatever, solar flares stuff, popping yeah. out around, and and it was it was very cool pictures, very neat to see, and uh, so is is a neat phenomenon. I, I've seen, I've seen what is it called a lunar eclipse? Yep, I've seen lunar eclipses. I've seen a few of those, but uh, this is the first solar eclipse that I'm aware of that I saw, and you saw one. You saw the seventy nine one, didn't you? Yep. Yep. And you told me I got a souvenir it. from it. <laughs> <laughs> got, I got eye burn from a solar burn from it. Yeah. Yeah. I got a little bit of a souvenir from that one, but oh well. So you're a living example of what not to do, right? Don't look at the sun when it's in the middle of a eclipse. <laughs> Why? Ah. ah, ah. <laughs> Never mind. Do it. <laughs> Never mind. Everybody should experience it at least once. <laughs> Why? <laughs> do you know how you do the shadow boxes? Uh, yeah, I remember as a kid. You mean the one I did in 79 and didn't use? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So l- with the shadow boxes, you have that reflection on the back wall of the box mm-hmm. through the pinhole. And uh, so you see the the reverse image 
on the back wall. It's almost like it's going through a, like a glass ball like reverses and yada, yada, yada. Anyways, so I saw a few things pop up and I, I never even thought to even be aware or look for it, but the same thing with uh, trees and leaves. Mm-hmm. So when the eclipse is going and it's not quite dark yet, the uh, I, I saw a video and pictures of uh, all the leaves there, all the little tiny holes as the sun comes through the leaves. It shows all these superimposed images on the ground of the eclipse. All these, and it, some of the pictures are hmm. amazing, like hundreds of little uh, eclipses on the ground wow. as, the, as it peeks through the leaves. There's a flashlight and you are never seen again. <laughs> no, you mean like the, uh, of the, uh, uh, rapture? No, that you float into the sky, don't you? Is that what's supposed to happen? No, that's the alien abduction part. Isn't it? <laughs> okay. I'm, yeah. I'm confusing them. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on. I'm, I'm, I'm either being raptured or abducted. I'm not sure which. <laughs> I'm not an expert on these things. <laughs> <laughs> Alien zombies are rapturing me. <laughs> I don't know what's going on anymore. I hope they got grilled cheese sandwiches. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> I'm curious how many people are going to be offended by that conversation. Oh, well. <laughs> hey. uh, science. I know, science. right? Science. <laughs> Call Bill Nye. He'll set them straight. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Bill Nye, <laughs> science guy. Um, I received an email. Oh, sorry. Do you got anything else to talk about before we actually get into the show this week? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. Well, no, there is, oh. there's a few things, but I can mention at the end. Okay. Well, I am going to mention something else. Mm-hmm. We're drinking Leinenkugel's Canoe Paddle Kolsch beer mm-hmm. from our buddy, John Carlson. Senior. Senior, who actually gave us that Hershey's one we were yes. remember last week. <laughs> well, who, you have to write the, names on the bottles next time oh, people give you beer. <laughs> you know what? It was easier when both of us are there getting- Somebody's the, paying attention. Because somebody's paying attention to who's given us what and can remember. <laughs> oh, no, that was by, that was by, that was by. Yeah. But because I was doing it myself this year, yeah. somebody drops it, Ma's, thank you, and then I'm off to do something else yeah. and it doesn't register. Yeah, we got to bring sticky notes and just stick them on, yeah. on everything <laughs> next year, so- don't feel like such a yeah. putz. <laughs> so thanks, John. <laughs> thanks, John. Uh, so yeah, this that's one actually ju- quite good. Yeah. So Canoe the Hershey beer from Kulsh. last week, I remember, it was very good. Yeah. This one here is a uh, Lenin Google, Lenin Google, Lenin Google's Canoe Paddle Kolsch. It's very good. Yeah, it's a fantastic Apparently beer. John knows what he's talking about when it comes. to I beer. know, right? Wow. He he could be a beer sommelier. Ooh. Our, our personal, we'll just send him a, send him some money. He can Wish buy his beer. <laughs> and just buy you what you like. Yeah. And then, then send we'll it send you money, way. John, and just supply us. Mm-hmm. Uh, I received an email from a gentleman named Henri de la Vega, which is an awesome name. I know. Henri de, de la, la Vega. Vega. Sounds like something out of a movie. I know, right? Great name. Uh, he's talking about Guardian Revival. And I'm thinking, oh, dokey. Uh, Guardian Revival is a New York State not-for-profit organization chartered to revive and preserve the mental health and well-being of veterans, first responders, our guardians, at no cost to them. That's awesome. Guardian is a defender, protector, or keeper. Our guardians are veterans and first responders, a far broader group than most people assume or imagine, who are exposed to mental and physical trauma and stress. As they are. Being in that line of work, right? Uh, military, fire and rescue, law enforcement, emergency medical services, emer- emergency dispatchers, corrections officers, and federal agents. And people don't think about the like the nine one one operators. Oh uh, yeah, can you imagine right? being on the line of somebody in a traumatic event? And yeah, one of the one of the hockey dads. You. Um, one of the goalie hockey dads when my son played hockey was a nine one one dispatcher. And he never talked about the calls because mm-hmm. you can only imagine, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, the stuff I hear from Tracy from coming home from the hospital, yeah. and, you know. Um, but yeah, you don't really think about the 911 yeah. operators of what they've got to go through. You see and experience people at their worst moments. Mm-hmm. And you're the first call. Yeah. Right? Stigmas related to mental health treatment among guardians make it even more difficult to address this problem, largely stemming from a culture that values self-reliance and toughing it out and marginalizes those experiences 
uh, experiencing distress or asking for help. Mm-hmm. You think of the military, you think of somebody dispatched, you're yeah. in a, you know, your, your unit's out yeah. on an exercise or, or something. And, yeah. uh, and you, you, you think about the Middle East, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're coming up in a firefight or something and you, you, you know, you got to just work through it. Yeah, exactly. And, right? and, and that's that's what you're trained to do. Yeah. Uh, Guardian Revival approaches the topic of mental health with non-clinical language and programs positioned to avoid these stigmas and barriers. Our programs offer a complementary approach to health care so that our guardians can improve their lives through empowered in, uh, integrative methods. And they list their goals here. And I, I went on their website and checked it out. And it's a pretty, pretty good website. Our goals decrease sense of loneliness, increased sense of purpose, growth in social network, increased sense of belonging, improved physical health. Together, these yield improved overall well-being. And all our programs are provided free to, of cost to guardians, so the support of donations, volunteers, and sponsorships make it all possible. So they do list on, on their website all these different thingies, but they got it broken uh, programs, and they got it broken into four different uh, segments. Uh, another summit, which is outdoor adventures, walking, hiking, backpacking, and paddling. Boots and paws. Providing dogs for the therapeutic benefits of animal companionship. Encore. Opportunities to learn, write, play, record, and share music. Music for me has always been a big thing. Getting outdoors. Well, getting outdoors has always been a big thing. Sitting with my dog has mm-hmm. always been a good yeah. thing. Music, listening to it and, and stuff like that. Uh, and G-Connect. Virtual and in-person experiences to connect with guardians and the community. So those are the four programs that they offer. So another summit's outdoor adventures range from range from beginner to advanced difficulty levels and are led by certified outdoor leaders. They welcome guardians of all ages and ability levels, including those with accessibility needs. Uh, our adventures are located throughout New York and the New- Northeast. We organize transit accessible adventures throughout the Hudson Valley and New York City area. And you think like accessible, like, you know, but you have vets come back and you have, they're, yeah, they're, they're missing a missing leg limbs or and, something like or that. Or major right? injuries, trauma, yeah. etc. cetera. Um, he says, we, in, in his email to me, he says, we have a nine day Allagash river trip coming this summer. It's sort of a step up program with a training day, wilderness first aid certification, three day training trip, and then nine day Allagash trip. This is 100% free for veterans and first responders. Our applications are open till May 5th, and we're trying to get the word out. So he asked if we could just mention it. So it's mentioned. But, like I said, I went to the website, and I want to talk more about what they're offering, the, the, the guardians here. Our 2024 Epic Canoe Adventure will take place on the Allagash River in northern Maine, a waterway known for its scenic beauty and ample wildlife. You and your team of fellow guardians will spend seven days traveling 82 miles from Indian Brook to Allagash Village. On the way, you will encounter large lakes, waterfalls, Class 2 rapids, and if we're lucky, some of the moose that call the waterway home. Epic Venture Program is a collection of outings and training meant to prepare you to begin your own outdoor story. Participants of the Epic Adventure Program will receive classroom instruction, field training, wilderness first aid certification, physical training plan, and equipment. So the the whole point of it is to get you trained, get you into the outdoors so that it doesn't stop there, that you continue and you realize, you know, what the outdoors can do for you. Exactly. And what it is, in my perception of it is, uh, so a lot of people who are in the military, they, or in firefighting services, police services, there, there's a lot of trauma bonding. And when you leave that family, that, that group, it, it can be, it can be wrenching because you're suddenly, uh, you, you are losing a family when you leave the military or the mm-hmm. police services or firefighter services or whatever it is. And so this is like you're finding a 
a way to find camaraderie without the trauma bonding. Right. So, and it's, it's another, it's a group activity. It's what you're used to when you gained your, your, your trauma or, or whatever ails you. And, and so I, I can see where this would be beneficial to get people together, like-minded people in a group setting and, and learn new skills and see what it can do if it's something for you. Like, it may not work for everybody, but I, I, you know, I, I've, if from my experience, it does work. It's, it's a different, way of having people build that camaraderie without the trauma bonding perspective. Yeah. All major gear and food is provided. Participation for this outing is by application. Once you've completed the application, been approved, you will join a team of military and first responder outdoor enthusiasts and complete several team and skill building activities. So it's not like they just... You're not just throw you paddling. into a boat and say, yeah. "Here, we're going to follow it's us." It's like Survivor. <laughs> yeah. Participating in this program means participating in all the events below. Uh, Saturday, May 11th, Paddling 101 Indoor Outdoor Hybrid Classroom Day. Saturday and Sunday, May 18th and 19th, Wilderness First Aid. Monday, June 3rd, Virtual Pre-Training Check-in. June 7th to 9th, Canoe Training Weekend. Monday, June 24th, virtual pre-adventure check-in. Uh, don't miss the epic opportunity to participate in a world-class outing led by our outdoor experts. Experience the amazing Maine woods, learn how to canoe camp, and do it all alongside a hand-picked team of fellow veterans and first responders. Um, so yeah, uh, Guardians only. Friday, July 5th to Saturday, July 13th is the actual trip. Departs from Beacon, uh, New York, on July 5th at 11 in the morning. Uh, veter- there, you meet at the Veterans Memorial Building, uh, Main Street, Beacon, New York. They call it, the difficulty is red. It's strenuous. Yeah. So red adventures are more difficult and are recommended for experienced hikers or those who are physically fit. Distance, 82 miles. Duration, 9 days. Applications must be submitted before 8 p.m. on Sunday, May 5th. Our Epic 2024 Epic Canoe Adventure Team will be announced on Wednesday, May 8th. Uh, now, they do have other summit trips happening, uh, if, if you want to um, check those ones. Go to guardianrevival.org, click the calendar tab at the top of the page, and there you can find all these different things that they're doing. You can also go to, to, to guardianrevival.org to find out more information about Guardian Revival um, or use the contact page, send them a message and for any information you can't find. But this sounds like quite the deal. It's a great opportunity to yeah. kind of get back into that group thing. Like what it's common, I, I, I'm familiar with it here in Canada and I, I've heard a lot about it in the States where there's, there's not a lot of post service support mm-hmm. for military members and i imagine there's still the same lack of support for like if you're getting out of the fire services emt or or police services like there's not a lot of post work uh, support that's available yeah. to and, and i i know the canadian military is horrible for it and we're known to be horrible for it so it's i think stuff like this is fantastic to create a that external support system that people could reach out to and participate in. It's unfortunately a lot of people are so traumatized by it that they don't like doing these group activities. But I I think if they did try it out, it's a great opportunity to kind of experience that camaraderie again. And, and, and you can see where the schedule is set up to do different various things like with wilderness first aid and, and all this stuff. It's, I think it's a fantastic thing to get back into that group event and, mm-hmm. and adventuring and, and so on. And it's, saying that they're hand picking, you got to think they're looking at all the applicants and they're going to get people with all sort of the same yeah. experience, yeah. similar experiences yep. and put them in a group to go, you know what, you guys are all going through the same thing here, help each mm-hmm. other out. And you never know what could come from that group, right? Yeah. A couple of, you know, there's three of you that, that enjoyed the trip so much you're, you're going on another trip together yeah. or we'll you're, mix you're, you with some people who knew people and mm-hmm. yeah expand you know expand on the experiences for everybody yeah 
Uh, again, guardianrevival.org if you want to check things out and find out more information. Uh, but if yeah, check out this uh, trip. Um, and uh, if it's up your alley, get your get your application in and go on the Allagash River. Um, other thing that you came across. Yes. <laughs> this looks kind of fun. Doesn't it? It looks pretty amazing. So I I remember what was the event that we did on Canada 150. Do you remember when we did the Canada 150 up at Lake of Two Rivers on the beach? Uh, I was I just watched from the beach, but we saw people doing canoe tug of war and and stuff like that. And that would have been you and Mike Burns because I was on been. my way across the country. At that point. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so it was me, and Mike Burns, then. But yeah, so it was it was interesting to see all that kind of stuff. And and so when I saw this, it's like, oh, I want to try this. This looks no one so thinks fun. about sports with canoes other than racing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Normally. Yeah. Normally. Normally. Yeah. yeah. So stand up paddleboard jousting. Yes. <laughs> Full contact. Stand up paddleboard is difficult. Well, okay, it was difficult for me. I'm sure there's people out there that are very experienced at stand up paddleboard that have their balance, have their feet under them. I'm not one of them. But uh, when I saw these, this jousting, it's like you you gear up, put on your helmet and your life jacket, and and you paddle at each other just in a medieval jousting event. And so some of the videos that I saw, they just have this big ball, padded ball, padded on, ball one on one end of the stand-up paddleboard uh, uh, paddle, and so they would paddle at each other, practically ramming, and then they just reach out and joust with their paddles. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, the ones I watched didn't have helmets. Uh, they I, were just yeah. going willy nilly at yeah, each yeah, other. Yeah, yeah, with they had their life jackets on and they had their paddles <laughs> as weapons. <laughs> I mean, that, you had me at weapons. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think this would be so fun. They say it's not a real sport, and then in brackets, yet. yet. <laughs> Uh, a full contact sport, man. It's, yeah, it's just like watching a medieval joust between yeah, yeah. knights on horses, <laughs> except you're a couple of goobers on yeah, paddleboards. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it just looks like it's a lot of fun. I I think that'd be a, a really fun group event. You get it somewhere as camping and and whatever. Yeah, you have some stand up paddleboards and you just, just go at each other. And so, <laughs> how'd you break your nose this weekend? <laughs> well, let me tell you. I took a paddle yeah. right to the face. I told my buddy, <laughs> hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> and from from the videos that I saw, it uh, generally the people that were going down were the people that were too aggressive and they just lost their balance so, yeah so take the hit <laughs> yeah it, win the win the game exactly take the hit and uh, <laughs> it, was just, it just looks so fun i want to do it i so want to do it if you can brace and that's yeah that's what i saw is if you can brace yourself enough yeah yeah to take that hit yeah like you're a stone wall dude's bouncing right off you and whoop, over he goes <laughs> yeah they put themselves off balance when they yeah. reach out with the paddle see <laughs> <laughs> Unless you're braced so far leaning into it and dude misses, then you yeah. just fall over. <laughs> yeah. I guess you could practice for it by doing lots of uh, stand-up paddleboard yoga or something. Maybe. <laughs> right? I'm just thinking. Learn your balance, your core gotta strength. There's got to be some way to up the game of this, not just hit <laughs> yeah. with a paddle. Maybe. Because in a joust, mm -hmm. if they miss or their their lances break, they get off their horses and sword fight. Oh, yeah? So I'm thinking some sort of swords in the middle. Of <laughs> you just paddle up next to each other and start whacking the crap out of each other with swords. Like safe swords. Yes, of course. <laughs> For the sissies out there. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That would be a hoot. Wouldn't that you be know what? That would be a fun thing if you can. And you can't do it in canoes because that's not really no. as fun. No, it's not really as fun. I mean, fun. we've seen that as it's well. It's so much easier to hurt yourself if you're standing in a canoe, as I learned from, from canoe polling. Yeah. But uh, it's not a paddleboard. You're just falling on the board or you're falling in the water. The water. Generally, 99 times out of 100, yeah. you're falling into the water because you've lost your balance. <laughs> your your core goes off, off the center line and it just pulls you down. <laughs> it's like, I'm going down. Ah. <laughs> that sounds like fun. It does. It does. 
I think you should uh, get a couple of stand up paddle boards and I've try. got one. Do I just you? need some we need people with more stand up paddle boards. Let's, let's get an event together. We'll do barbecue. <laughs> oh, can we if if I put a team together and you put a team together <laughs> Where my we team's go? my team's going to be filled with ringers. <laughs> I'm not on the team. <laughs> I'm the organizer. Hmm. Let's think about this now. Yeah. <laughs> I'll get back to you on it. <laughs> yeah, that'd be a hoot. Uh, for any professional stand-up paddleboarders out there, <laughs> drop me a line at sean at paddlingadventuresradio.com. We'll chat. Yeah. Well, we can't do it in Lake Ontario. It's too cold. Oh, now you're going to say, you're going to start drawing <laughs> lines on what's too much? Really? Well, We're about to beat the crap out of each other. I know I'm going sticks. to be in the water. I know I'm going to be in the water, and I don't want to be in Lake Ontario water. Well, we won't be doing it right now. <laughs> what? It's Lake Ontario water is cold all summer long. That's more of an uh, initiative not to fall to go in. in, right? <laughs> <laughs> you think you're about to jump? Jump on your paddleboard buddy's uh, <laughs> board there. Tack them yeah. full on. <laughs> um, yeah, we'll we'll follow that one. See what we can do with that. Mm-hmm. Gibson's Paddle Club in Gibson, BC. I don't know that Gibson is the same place as Gibson's Landing. I think it is. Do so you? there's Gibson's, the township, and Gibson's Landing, which is the dock area. Because that's where beachcombers is. It is. Supposed it is. To I've always reach and I've always wanted to go there. Yes. Yeah. Jesse yeah. and Relic. <laughs> Constable John. <laughs> Great show. I love that show. Yeah. yeah. I love that show. Canadian show. Yep. Back in the 70s. Nick 80s. Adonidas. Yeah. What was his ship's name? It was... Persephone. Persephone. There you go. It is... Bad that I can remember all these details. <laughs> I don't remember what I had for lunch last week. But let me tell you what happened in 1977 when I was nine years old. Yes. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, Gibson's Paddle Club in Gibson, B.C. promotes the sport of outrigger canoeing, which means their members are on the water several times a week. Paddlers see all kinds of nature, but also floating debris, such as styrofoam, plastic, rope, and other assorted marine items. I kind of think they'd see a lot more ocean-y type, yeah. big boat type stuff than like we we're seeing here. Like broken up docks and foam blocks and yeah. fishing floats and netting, and there's a lot of... Yeah, we just get the bottles, get pop and, bottles and fire <laughs> golf extinguishers. Balls. <laughs> Their crew decided to make it a mission to collect what they could what they could, and call themselves the Ocean Rangers. When debris is sighted, they stop the canoe and retrieve what they can, but they were unsure what to do with all the collected debris. I mean, the stuff we collect, just we just throw in a local recycling yeah, throw in the bin, yeah, sort of deal, recycle right? bin. Thanks to the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada, the Ocean Legacy Foundation has established an ocean plastic depot to collect and recycle select ocean plastics and marine debris. And there's got to be an awful lot of it for them to set up a depot, mm -hmm. right? Uh, depot is located in the Seychelles landfill, and new members are given orientation to the site as well as safety training by SCRD personnel before using the depot. Recently, Kate and Dave Barrett, along with Bob Field, visited the landfill for orientation and transported the first collection of styrofoam from the Paddle Club compound to the Ocean Plastic Depot. And the picture they showed on the on the website is like a big one of those, uh, like you see a landscape or something, got one of those big trailers, oh, okay, a yeah, covered yeah. trailer sort mm -hmm. of thing, filled. Hmm. Like that's an awful lot. People dump a lot of stuff in the ocean. Yeah. Uh, periodically, the debris is collected by the Ocean Legacy Foundation, taken to another facility where it is sorted, shredded, washed, then processed into pellets to be used in remanufactured products. What they collect will now be recycled into usable products. Nice. Ocean Legacy Foundation is a Canadian-based nonprofit organization that was founded in 2013 with the goal to end ocean plastic waste. The Ocean Legacy Plastic Program is now able to produce recycled marine debris 
from uh, from processed plastic recovered from used marine gear, coastal shorelines, and our ocean for use in the manufacturing of new value-added durable products. If you want to find out more about the Ocean Plastic Depot, go to oceanplasticdepot.ca. And to find out more about Ocean Legacy Foundation, go to legacyplastic.ca. That's good for them. It's It's nice that... There's people organizing to get together to clean up the mess that we're making, mm-hmm. right? Well, like I say, I mean, we go up in our in our canoe up the local rivers, and mm-hmm. oh yeah, there's a bunch of plastic bottles just to throw them in the bottom of the canoe. And we get back mm-hmm. to shore, we'll just dump them in the yeah. whatever park we're launching from. We'll just throw them into their recycle bin mm-hmm. or garbage cans, whatever. But if you're but on this a long- isn't something yeah. like this isn't small stuff. No, this is something that. Uh, so you're if you're on a trip or if you're doing something, you only have so much room to collect stuff. Yeah, and so you're not going to be able to pick up a dump truck load of stuff from a kayak. No, right, not at all. But I mean, even still, uh, uh, you you need. A lot of trips up and down our local rivers to collect. <laughs> I know. That much. Garbage. There's so much. There's so much stuff that gets dumped. So the fact that they're, I mean, now mind you, you see things every so often on, on the internet about people finding um, storage uh, containers that have washed off a ship. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You know, it's filled like washing machines or something. I saw you one know. the other day. They uh, They had a big chop saw. And so it was like a bunch of guys on a fishing trawler. They sidled up to the bin and they cut a like a six foot hole in the side, and it was filled with cell phones. Really? <laughs> so they started tossing them up onto the deck, and it was just box after box of like. like I guess you could. I mean, or they're they're out there making their living, so it's not like they could just hook that up and bring it in. Bring yeah. some of them are out there like quite a way. I mean, they're hours to get out there. And and what you hear about often too is uh, is people who who spend their lives out at sea on sailboats and stuff. Mm-hmm. Like middle of the night you're on a crossing and suddenly you get the bottom ripped out of your boat because you hit a submerged uh, sea container. Right? Cuz these sea containers they can get waterlogged and if they're just buoyant enough to be at the waterline, you won't see it, but you'll hit it. Mm-hmm. Right. That's just like, you know, in a river, you're coming along and it's like you get surprised in a rapid by a big rock. It's like, ah, where'd that I rock didn't come see from? That, yeah. Or a came, log or something. Yeah. yeah. So can you imagine doing that with a sea container? It's like, oh. Right. <laughs> in the middle of the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. It's not like you can just zip 20 feet that way and exactly. hop on shore. And they lose, ships lose these things all the time. Yeah. Like, can you imagine a, a 40 foot sea container with filled with like Nike sneakers or, oh, or a shoe or, for the rest of my <laughs> life? And none of them are your size. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ocean Plastic Depot and Legacy Plastic, both .ca. Check them out. But yeah, it's pretty cool that they've. Like I say, it's got to be a big enough problem that uh, they've built a, a depot for them to drop stuff off. Yep. Wow. Uh, we've heard about different states that require everybody to get a sticker or whatever for their for their boats and stuff like that. The Oregon Marine Board is urging compliance. So define urging. I guess telling people do it. Can you get a ticket? I that I never saw hmm. any information about that. Uh, the Oregon Marine Board trying to boost participation in its permit program for non-motorized watercraft like paddle boards. According to the board, compliance is especially low in uh, a couple of counties. Stand-up paddle boards and kayaks grow in popular, popularity every year, but the OMB doesn't know how many of these non-motorized boats are actually out on the water. Kind of sounds like the gun registry, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Let's just throw that out there. Yeah. Uh, anecdotally, we believe there are around 300,000, which is almost double what we have in motorized. Uh, and the OMB uh, said the OMB's Ashley Massey, and she says the number of waterway access permits issued is much lower. Because the paddling is such a wonderful activity and so many people do it, and it's become so accessible to pick up at Buy Mart or Costco, stand-up paddleboard or kayak, it's really difficult to get a sense of what those numbers look like. Permits have been required since 2020 for anyone who operates a non-motorized paddlecraft, 
and that includes stand-up paddle boards that are 10 feet or longer. So our canoes, we yeah. would need our canoes, our kayaks, we would need to get a permit mm-hmm. since 2020. Uh, Massey says, when our marine law enforcement are patrolling waterways and they're engaging with paddlers, a lot of them aren't aware that this permit program is even around. Permit program? I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about for the fifth time. Are they just trying to get numbers? Like, what's the purpose of the permit well, program? see, if they were just trying to get numbers, then it would be, you know what? Go online, register, register for free. print it off, carry it with you. Mm-hmm. Permits cost between $5 and $30. guess it depends on the length or type of boat. I don't know. Some families have like six kayaks and say only three people want to go paddling. You need three out there, says Massey. So it's one permit per boat and they are transferable to other watercraft. They say it weird. They should say yeah. what, permit per person. Per person, not per boat. Yeah. Like that doesn't make sense. And, but then again, if it's if it's a canoe with two people in it, only one person needs a permit, or the canoe ne- is. I can see yeah. why they went with watercraft because, it, like, kayaks generally have one person pa- paddle boards, one person canoes, two people, whatever. Right. So I can see where they said, you know what, let's not hammer the people who are going multiple people per paddle. Like, let's do it per craft. Yeah, per craft. Yeah. <clears throat> but you don't have to. You only have to have enough permits to cover. The number of people there. So, recreators are supposed to carry the permit with them, either a paper or digital copy. Kids 14 and under are exempt. Paddlers also need to carry a properly fitting U.S. Coast Guard approved and readily accessible life jacket and whistle. Children 12 and under must wear a life jacket while on board. Money from the permit goes to develop separate access where possible, especially in areas where there's mixed-use boating, says Massey. A lot of the conflict that we are hearing about uh, out on the waterways was coming from motorized boaters saying they can't use the launch ramp because so many people are in the way. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking that's bit hooey yeah for the most part. if i'm in a canoe and somebody was, i don't need to somebody's hold. backing a boat in i'm moving yeah. out of the way well when we went to tobamori people were were backing their boats in yeah and i mean it's a lot faster for us to jump in oh yeah so yeah. we just they're backing their boat in okay you guys get your they're getting out they're starting to get it off the trailer mm-hmm. we throw our canoes in we're gone they pull the truck out yeah yeah, it, it's yeah, it's that's a bit of a. I think we're a bull hooey thing. If, I'm if I was going to guess what the whole purpose behind this is, is because there's a lot of enforcement. If there's any issues, if there's to get the enforcement officers out on the water, it costs money. Mm-hmm. So it's a method. It's a taxation method to help pay for those services. I would have no problems having a permit. If it was free, and all I had to do was go online, mm-hmm. say, "Here's what my boat is. Here's my name. Blah blah blah." But I got three. I got three boats. I think it's more than registration, though. I think it's more. Well, I can see where regi- registration would come in handy because then during enforcement, they could say, "I need your permit," and your permit would have all your details. Mm-hmm. It's like having a driver's license in a car. Let me see your driver's yeah. license and shirts, whatever. Right. So, and if it's transferable between watercraft, and if I've got one, and it's got my name, it's got. Hmm, my yeah, my is that too. my sixteen foot prospector. It's got my fifteen foot osprey. It's got my kayak mm-hmm. on it. Like okay, as okay, well. Confusing. If they go out there and find a boat, because mm-hmm. I don't know if the the do you have uh, to keep the, it on the boat. No, you got to keep yeah. it on you. Yeah, but it doesn't know. It doesn't say whether there's something that you put on the boat or not, like a sticker. I know right? because that way, if you got, you know, you you you. Your boat floats away or something. They mm-hmm. know. They can contact you. Yeah. Go, uh, was he out yeah. paddling? Or did Are we just... missing a person or is this a lost boat? Or just a, a lost boat. Or... Yeah. Hmm. So, yeah, it's, it's, they don't, they didn't get enough information on why they want to yeah. keep track of. It seems more expensive to run the program than it would mm-hmm. be to. It seems more like a, it, it tends to seem more like a money grab. Yeah. Because it, I don't know, unless I'm missing something. I, I don't really see the reason mm-hmm. why they need to know. Yeah. Like, look at all those cottages. How many cottages have right? 
a cottage canoe out a there. A half dozen water That probably like hasn't that. been used in 50 years <laughs> yes, or exactly. something, right? Like, yeah, that's a cottage canoe. It yeah. gets used once a year when somebody comes up to visit. Yeah. I'm still I'm still big on the having the little sticker on the inside of your canoe that says, hey, this is my name. This mm. is my canoe. This, if if you find this stuff canoe, back. you know, call this number, yeah. send an email to here. Because that way, yeah, if it does blow away, they've got something to go mm-hmm. on, right? So, well, hmm. we'll see what happens with uh, in Oregon. Yeah, exactly. In 2020, way, way, way back. Oh, ancient it, times. It was a quiet adventure symposium. Oh, yes. And this gentleman walks up and says, hello, my name is Riley McClincha. And I do something called run yakking. And he gave me his card. And I looked at him and I looked at his card and I said, what is run yakking? <laughs> if you go listen to our episode number 222, which is like 203 episodes is ago. Is it 221? Oh, sorry, 221. Yeah, 200. Did I say 222? You did. I meant 221. Everybody knew that. <laughs> Everybody knew it. Everybody knew I was talking in episode 221. Uh, we talk ab- about his whole run yakking thing and what it is. Um, but basically it's, he jumps in this kayak and he'll paddle, you know, 20 miles. Then he'll get out of the kayak and he'll run, not walking, mm-hmm. not hitching a right, yep. run back to where he parked his car, where he started yep. paddling from and then drive to wherever he got out of his canoe and park his car or his kayak jump back in the kayak, paddle, paddle another X amount of miles, mm-hmm. get out, run back to his car, <laughs> drive back to the kayak and park. Do a loop, man. Just do then, a loop. <laughs> yeah, yeah, do and then repeat many times, yeah. right? Yeah. That's run yakking. So he sent me a message saying, thought I would give an update. Because he came across this, this one that we did and he listened yeah. to it again. It's, uh, thought I'd give an update. I made it to Chicago so, uh, summer of 2022 and now trying to get to the Gateway Arch in St. Louis because he's from New York. He's yep. even paddled from New York. Mm-hmm. Uh, so far, I've made it to Liverpool, Illinois, the Illinois River, where I stopped last October. The hiatus ends in two weeks, April 22nd. I plan to continue. Hope to make it to the mouth of the Illinois this fall, the confluence of the Mississippi River. Next year in 2025, crossing my fingers, I'll make it to the arch. Cool. So, um, he uses a nine and a half foot kayak. He's called Swifty. Mm -hmm. He has run yacked 3,916 miles. 6,300 kilometers. 6,300 kilometers. Good God. Right. Uh, he has about 650 miles left to go on this trip, and he hopes to finish in July. Hmm. Pretty well, cool. It is cool. It is cool. It, and it just exhausts me thinking about it. Well, I, I remember, like I listened to part of the episode there that, from episode 221, and I said, and I still hold true, I have friends that would do this. Hmm. And I would do this if it did not include the running aspect. <laughs> Just the, the, the yakking. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I, like if you didn't have to run all the way back and get your, I'd run all the way back, get my car and just head home. <laughs> <laughs> Paddle 25 miles, run back 25 yeah, yeah. miles, jump in your car, call it a day. <laughs> See you next summer. <laughs> Where I would then paddle two kilometers, mm-hmm. <laughs> run back to my car, call it a day. <laughs> <laughs> that enough? It's going to take me about 213 years to, <laughs> to make it. Uh, no, he seems to thoroughly enjoy mm-hmm. this. Um, he's having a blast doing it. gives us something to do. So he's also the author of The Run Yakker's Journey. And along with being a retired science teacher has accomplished an array of feats, including being an Olympic torchbearer, okay. a Guinness World Record holder for memorizing Pi, okay. a singer, songwriter, guitarist with his own repertoire of almost 
400 songs that he performs mostly from memory. And he has completed five marathons of 26.2 miles each while dribbling three basketballs, which is referred to as drubbling. <laughs> I don't know where the three basketball parts came I from. I know, I know, I know. But, and I've seen pictures of him doing it. So this is a lot. Like, this, my, my wife is impressed when I do the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> you got nothing on Riley. <laughs> nothing. Nothing. <laughs> so hopefully, wow. by uh, hopefully he gets as far as he wants to this this year, um, and hopefully he makes it all the way to St. Louis by next year. Because you got to think, six hundred fifty miles there, six hundred fifty miles running back, six hundred fifty miles driving mm-hmm. there. <sighs> I'd be stopping like Burger King or Do a loop. White Castle or something <laughs> along the way. <laughs> well, good luck, Riley. Uh, let us know uh, what you what's what happens with this, and hopefully it all goes your way. And uh, yeah, we'll we'll keep an eye out. International Rafting Federation. This is uh, another good one. International Rafting Federation has announced that they've recently joined 54 other signatory sports organizations to support the Sport for Nature framework. Hmm. Framework was developed as a collaborative effort between the following organizations. International Union for Conservation of Nature, the International Olympic Committee, the United Nations Environment Program, the Secretariat of Convention on, on Biological Diversity, and the Sales of Change Foundation. The foundation strives to build on and complement existing initiatives and efforts, including the UN Sports for Climate Action Framework. Hmm. That's pretty big. That's pretty, yeah, big and diverse. Mm-hmm. It aims to bring together the sports and nature conservation communities at all levels and in all regions of the world, from local clubs to global sports organizations. Signatories pledge to adhere to four key framework principles to protect the environment while contributing to national and global biodiversity goals. As a signatory, our organization is committed to protecting and avoiding damage to natural habitats and species, including respecting protected areas. It takes positive action to restore and regenerate nature in and around the indoor and outdoor environments where we operate. will reduce risks to nature and enable opportunities to conserve and restore nature in our uh, supply chains, linking wherever possible to climate goals, and will educate and inspire greater awareness and action for nature within our sport and our wider communities and stakeholders. Wow. That's That's a lot. That's a lot. The IRF is... Uh, well positioned to join the effort, having already created the IRF Practical Guide to Sustainability in January 2021. And we've talked about that one before, their their guide when they, yes. when they came out with that. Guide identifies practical actions to implement during recreational and competitive rafting events that achieve the four framework goals described above. Examples of practical actions can be found in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the site of the 2022 and 2024 World Championships, including limiting individual vehicle access to venues and providing shuttle bus access to competitors, support staff, and volunteers, and using water trucks to provide drinking water at race venues instead of single-use plastic bottled water. Good. Well, I mean, you, you you think you got forty people on a bus as mm-hmm. opposed to forty cars? Yeah, right. Yeah. That's that's huge. Um, besides helping the environment, these practices have also the added benefit of saving costs and making race venues a safer, more pleasant experience for locals and competitors. Finally, the example of the IRF members contributing to these goals is the USA securing. Uh, the USA securing team jerseys manufactured from recycled plastic bottles huh. for their 2024-2025 competition rafting teams. 
Increasing the pace and scale of implementing sustainability practices is influenced by numerous factors, but fortunately, many can be achieved through knowledge sharing and a collective will embraced by national racing organizations, international racing industry, and competitors. That's interesting. That's huge. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, and it's like you, you got these these races that are going on down the rivers and all that, and you got all the the spectators, yeah. and you know they're they're along the riverbanks watching, and things are getting trampled, and things that garbage is being thrown, and anything you can limit, exactly to stop that yeah. environmental impact, stop the way is what they're gonna is what they're gonna look mm-hmm. to do. I have no. If you got a big water truck where I can just put <laughs> my reusable right? exactly. water bottle yeah. underneath and refill it. I mean, the only reason I ever go to events and end up with a plastic water bottle is because there is nowhere to refill. There's no opportunity. Yeah. There's nowhere. Yeah. Or I'll buy a, a plastic water bottle and just keep refilling it all mm-hmm. weekend. Yeah. Like, it's not a not an issue. I mean, I'm the one that drank out of it to begin with, so. So, that's interesting. It was developed by, like, organizations like the IOC, International mm-hmm. Olympic Committee and stuff. But did you pull the list of the 54 other sports organizations that are part of this network? No. But hmm. there, there is, there's a massive list of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I could pull it, to be precise. I could pull it, and we could just like spend like ten minutes reading them. No, no, no. I'm curious if <laughs> I'm curious if there are any other water sports that were involved. Like we, you pulled up specifically the International Rafting Federation. Mm-hmm. So I'm just curious if there's any other water sports or. Yeah, like, no, that's just because they've just done this. Yes, I know. Right. I know. I'm curious who else is involved. I'll have to yeah. look that up afterwards. Yeah, check, take take a peek at that. Mm-hmm. Sport for nature framework. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there's like I say, when you got big guys like this in here, you know there's going to be some big organizations oh, to yeah. help out, exactly. support, and IOC. Whatnot. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. awesome. United Nations is involved. This is incredible, right? Well, good. This is this is it's progress, right? We uh, we have to progress. We ha- can't just continue doing what we're currently doing. No, right? Throwing garbage at our butts as we go along, and and not caring about the planet and doing whatever. So this is this is a climate action framework, and it's something to create a better way to sustain sport. Because who wants to who wants to have a canoe race if you're if you're trying to fight what your way through all these discarded water bottles and so on, right? Right. So yeah, and you, you can't have people just trying to pick up garbage constantly because mm-hmm. it doesn't matter how many waste containers you have, somebody's just going to throw it on the ground. Yeah. Like, how many times have you been somewhere, seen a waste container, somebody goes to throw a bottle or something, and it bounces aside, and they just, okay, whatever. Yeah, yeah. That's good enough. It's close enough to the garbage can. I do that. I go through, uh, I if I have garbage in my truck, Mm -hmm. I throw it out at home or at work. Yes. Right? Yeah. Or if I'm going into Tim Hortons, I grab my Tim Hortons garbage, dump it in the disposal as I'm going to him. Here, you can have it back. The amount of people, if I go through the drive through Tim Hortons by my work. Yeah. The amount of people that pull up to the drive through there's a garbage can right at the beginning oh, of the drive through and it's literally and all around it. They think they're 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 Michael Jordan. <laughs> they think they're <laughs> you know do this. like and and they they're tossing garbage and it's bouncing off yeah. and it's all around the garbage can. Mm-hmm. You know, there's probably as much around the garbage can on the ground and then the winds pick up and blow yeah. all that everywhere. Exactly. It's like Carry it in. You're not yeah. Michael Jordan. You're not making that shot from 10 feet away yeah. from your car window yeah. with a coffee cup that's half empty. Like, come on. I, I, I remember it brings to mind a time I was I was going through the drive-thru, and so the guy left the drive-thru, and he held up traffic for a bit. I could see he was doing something. And so what I figured out afterwards is that he was dumping his cup of coffee into his mug or whatever his yeah. his his go cup or whatever and uh and so as i i was i figured this out afterwards because he paused held up traffic and then he went again and out through his passenger window flew the empty coffee cup yep and it's like he just transferred that to a steel container or whatever his, his yeti or whatever and and he just hoofed it out the window why and, and it's like why did you yeah. do that that's the I same was, with, with cigarette butts i, I was so shocked i know uh yeah but I was so shocked to see him just that yeah. empty coffee cup flies out the window. He's like, okay, I'm done with this now. I'm done with this now. Somebody else will take care of it. Yeah, it's like, it's crazy. Anyway, it's, just, it's the same with this. Yep. You yep. Know? We people, have to they, do better. They, people, people, you def, we definitely have to do better. Well, I don't. 
It's the rest of you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm already doing really good. <laughs> I'm doing my share, damn you all. Uh, well, let's just end this show. <laughs> You're not going to do your list? <laughs> oh, no. We're going to end this show on oh. a highlight. <laughs> so, not, not, I will go out on the limb right now <laughs> and say... Some topics we talk about sound <laughs> really good when we start them. Yeah. But halfway through, you realize, this is crap. <laughs> what have I gotten myself into? So, it seemed like a good idea at the it time. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> have you ever been on the internet and you're looking at all these um, positive vibe, positive yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, signs and quotes and yeah. uplifting and all that sort of stuff to, hey, all right, this is awesome. I feel so much better now. <laughs> That's great advice. So I came across this thing, 10 adventurous river rafting quotes. Oh, this ought to be good. But, you know, something like this, usually I'd copy and paste so I could read them out. Well, I wasn't able to because the format it was in. So I started typing. And by the time <laughs> I got to number five, I'm thinking, ah, this is, yeah. <laughs> but I've gone this far now, so <laughs> I'm just going to spread it with everybody. <clears throat> it kind of, it kind of, they're, they're not as good, but it kind of reminds me of the Siren Live skits with uh, Jack Handy. Right? Uh, Sp- inspirational coach. And Jack gosh Handy. darn it, people like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, 10 adventurous river rafting quotes. <laughs> you got, you got to know that whoever came up with these, well, we have two theories. Yep. yep <laughs> we yep, have yep. two working theories. Yep, A, yep. they're genuinely, ge- genuinely. Yeah. Thinking, you know what? This is, this is, so, this is really good. This, this is, is so empowering. This is inspirational. <laughs> yeah. This is, this is so positive. This, this sounds really good. Yeah. <laughs> or. <laughs> they were a there was campfire. a bunch of rafting guys <laughs> sitting around the fire, three sheets to the wind, <laughs> and someone said, oh, okay, up with a quote. Okay, okay. <laughs> who can record this because we're going to do this? And that's sort of what we're leaning to. I don't know. So, <laughs> 10 adventurous river rafting quotes. Number one. So hang on a sec. So we're gonna have <laughs> we're gonna draw this we're gonna up have for an a, hour. We're gonna have a diversity of people listening. And some of them are going, Oh, these are really good. I could live my life by these. And other people are gonna go, Oh my god, that's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> and we're falling right in the middle of all of <laughs> yes. this. Because some of them are okay, okay, okay. Maybe if we worded it differently, but yeah, I get the gist yeah, of yeah, it. Yeah. Uh, I, I went to an art gallery with a buddy once. And we were looking at this. It was a, a local gallery. And we're looking at this thing. And, and one lady goes, well, that's art. And my buddy looked her dead in the eye and says, I may not know art, but I know crap. And that's crap. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, I'm just saying, whatever your point of view is here. In the eye of the beholder. <laughs> in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> so, number one, the 10 adventurous river rafting quotes. Water has the power to cleanse, heal, and rejuvenate us. And rafting is the perfect way to tap into that power. Okay? Yeah. Understand? Yeah. Yep. It's cheesy, but it's good. Rafting, number two, rafting is not about conquering the rapids. It's about embracing the flow of life. This person does yoga. Yes. <laughs> number three, rafting is not just a sport. It's an opportunity to get wet. <laughs> Wild and wonderfully ridiculous. <laughs> I'm not even. This person's kinky. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's got a certain kind of swing at home. Uh, number four, life is a journey, and rafting is the perfect adventure. This guy was reaching for the stars, and he fell short. I'm thinking life is a journey. Rafting is the perfect mode of transportation. <laughs> <laughs> this gets you on your journey yeah, yeah, way. Yeah. <laughs> Number five, rafting is the ultimate test of teamwork, trust, and bravery. I can see that one. Yep. That I one can works. see that one. That one works. Number six, rafting is the perfect metaphor for life. Sometimes you have to paddle. Sometimes you have to hold on tight and ride the rapids. <laughs> okay. 
okay. They were reaching. Okay. They were reaching. Yeah. They, 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 they I understand what they're getting at. It needs to be worked on a bit. Number seven, life is better on the wild side, especially when it involves whitewater rafting. Yeah, that's just somebody saying, yeah, I don't need no whitewater rafting. Uh, yeah, that was that was guide number seven who really had nothing. <laughs> he had nothing. He was he was knee deep in like a couple of tacos yeah, at this point. He, he was thinking like, about it. I don't want to play this game. Yeah. I'm just going to say I'm this. only here because someone offered beer. <laughs> number eight, nothing is more thrilling than being on the edge of your seat and about to face your fears. Mm. That's like a roller coaster too. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what to think about that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go back to the drawing board, Chuck. Nine. Heaven is a little closer when you're on the water. <laughs> this one, this one reads horoscopes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm talking cheese, like cheese whiz yeah, on this yeah. one. And number ten. River rafting is the ultimate adventure where you confront both the power of nature and the power within yourself. <laughs> that that's gotta be the number number two yoga person as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And some of these you gotta read almost have to read it in a certain way. Yeah. To emphasize certain words. <laughs> rafting is not just a sport. It's an opportunity to get wet, wild and Wonderfully ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Does that do it for you? <laughs> yes, yes, that works. <laughs> Good time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need to come across more of these top ten lists. <laughs> I know. Because yeah, right you know, heaven's a little closer when you're on the water. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Oh. That was fun. <laughs> I can see where they're going with these ones, trying to get out there, but some of them are some of them are close to the mark. Others are see the mark and turn around, and go the other way. Um, that is all I've got. I think I've got a. I, I, I came across a a list of stuff going on over the summer, and some of them are prescient to us. Like they're coming up really soon. One is MacFest. It's in Marmara, Ontario. It's the Kawartha White water paddlers club so they they're, they're they kick off their spring season or their summer sorry, their summer season with mac fest uh float your fanny down the ganny is this weekend mm -hmm. and there was changes to that one uh what were the changes i didn't see well that. i think they're doing some construction on some part so it's starting at a different oh start i didn't point. know about that yeah yeah uh the, also this weekend is the raisin river canoe race in cornwall ontario i've 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 uh, I've watched people do that one. I watched the guy wrap a canoe around a tree in high water when I was in college on that one. <laughs> <laughs> and his name was Derek. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> James Zombar. <laughs> <laughs> it was a rental canoe too. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> hey, if you're going to wrap a canoe around yeah. a tree or a rock, it's better to be a rental canoe than yeah, yours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so those are the things that are going on this weekend. So I just thought I'd, I'd read those off as I came across this list. And it covers every month of the summer. So Mac, MacFest is where? Uh, well, is that know. up in Palma Rapids? Uh, yes, it's in... Yeah, yeah so it's... Uh, Quartha Whitewater Paddlers. Does it, is it the Palmer Rapids? No, there's a Palmer Fest coming. The up. Palmer Fest is the one I'm thinking. That's yeah, coming yeah, you're up, thinking I think, in May Fest. or something. Yeah. This is, uh, they're going to do it at actual events off river Saturday, the Iron Grill at 2-3rd Dance Station Road. Paddlers enjoy dinner, drinks, music, raffle draws. Uh, by day, the assembled organization, they organize themselves into unofficial groups for trips down the local rivers like the Salmon River, the Beaver River, the Moira River, the Scudamata River, the Black River, plus a bunch of local play spots. Uh, find your own local lodging, pitch a tent, the Iron Grill, price yet to be set, but is always affordable. So mm. this is just a whole bunch of different rivers, and it's the, it's the Quartha okay. Paddler, Whitewater Paddlers Oh, the courses, is, yeah. Yeah, they're opening. This is their season opener. Cool. So that's the, these those things that I mentioned are this weekend. MacFest, float your fanny down the ganny, and float your and fanny with the with the water being lower. Yeah, I wonder about that. Yeah, because yeah. that's the one people build funky. Oh yeah, they build anything that floats. If you can build it, <laughs> and you you go down yeah. and. and I think at least seventy percent of the people in oh, the water make it. they don't make it. Yeah, they're they swimming. don't. They don't make it. They go <laughs> swimming. Yeah, it's all fun though for the spectators. Exactly. Yeah. It's a huge spectator it's a huge. thing. Yeah. So, alrighty. Anything else? I do not have anything. That's it. Mm -hmm. I need to tell you off air. Mm -hmm. It'll probably it'll come out later about a couple of big trips I'm doing in August and 
Oh, October. right on. My October solo trip is going to be different. Oh, yeah? Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I am going, I'll just say this. It's going to involve a lot of spots between August and October trips. Yeah. In the U.S. Oh, wow. I'm going on a U.S. tour. Nice. West and south. Right on. That's all I'll say. And east. That sounds perfect. East, west, and south. Because there is no north. Was from this here. the trip you missed out on when you're supposed to go down in a couple of years Jerry ago? Vandiver? Yeah. Oh, right so on. So I'm going to hit a few spots heading down that way. But there's another part that don't tell Tracy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's going west, maybe as far as Utah. Oh. Uh-huh. Nice. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. There's the Gunnison out there. There's. Uh, few big rivers out there, the Colorado, mm-hmm. the San Juan, the San Tu, the San Three. There's a few trips I'm trying to put together right now, too. One is... Uh, out to Utah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that might be on the list now, but I, I have to be careful because I, I keep getting made fun of because I keep doing non-family trips with a bunch of people. And <laughs> so take the family. <laughs> no. 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 <laughs> Just no. I take them on trips. They do. The, I do trips with them like a couple weeks each year, but I don't need to use all my vacation. You are going to so love it when your kids are old enough and they're done college, university, and moving. Out. <laughs> yes. Freedom! <laughs> but I'm, I'm planning an early May spring breakup trip, fishing trip uh, to Algonquin. And uh, I'm potentially going to be doing uh, uh, a hiking trip in the fall, in September. Where? Superior. Oh. Mm. We'll like the, the back of the wolf head. Uh, from, yeah, uh, I think so. I, I don't, I'm not. Oh, Hattie's from, Cove? I think that's part of it. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. 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 That's mm-hmm. a great area up there. Mm-hmm. A lot of people do that hike trip. Yeah. We're going to do it over four or five days. So yeah. it should be good. Yeah. Looking forward to well, it. Well, in October, if you're looking to head down to the Adirondacks or something, and then want to go a bit farther. Yeah. I can drop you guys off and pick you up on the way back. <laughs> <laughs> My wife was playing with the idea of doing a long road trip. And she says, what do you think of this? And she sent me a screenshot of a route that took us all the way out west, like south of the border. And so when I asked you where John Van Berger lives, Mm -hmm. it's because we're trying to plan out the stops along the trip because we want to stop in and visit John. And uh, I said, I don't know where he is, but he's probably going to be there in the summer. Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we so we're thinking, but her route didn't include the Black Hills, so it's like, hey, I kind of want to see what? Rushmore and stuff, right? So ah, Mount Rushmore's for chumps. <laughs> I've been there once; it was <laughs> yeah. neat. But I go again. If you go to... around the back, yeah, you don't actually see their butts. They're not kneeling there. The rest of the body isn't there, like they show in the pictures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not real. <laughs> Apparently, fool me once, fool yeah. me twice. I not know, a third right? time. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. So she's planning on this big. Uh, Oh, well, you got to go to the... 7,600 kilometers. You got to go to uh, Deadwood exactly. and all that. Exactly. We did that when we lived in Saskatchewan. Yeah. We went down through North and South Dakota, mm-hmm. saw the big uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt National Park, saw all the big herds oh, of buffalo yeah, and everything, yeah, yeah. Yeah. and went down to see where Wild Bill Hickok was killed, and hmm. Boot Hill, and yeah. all that. Oh, see all that you got to see that if yes. you're going out there. Absolutely. And then keep on going and see where... Do, 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 do. Oh, oh, yes, the the, the mount. Devil's yeah. Mountain or whatever the it's called. Devil's Mount, yeah. Yeah, yeah. from thir- uh, Close Encounters of Third, third Kind. Yeah. yeah, that's out that That'll way. That'd be cool. See, so you, you're going out yeah. that way. And if you're out there, you might as well just go over to Yellowstone and check out the geysers yeah. and stuff. Real faithful. And you get <laughs> caught out in that big super volcano <laughs> underneath. I've always wanted to drive through Donner's Pass. See, see, see where the uh, going out there. See where the barbecue yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. Check it all out. <laughs> Daughters Pass apparently had like thirty feet of snow this year. See, one of the biggest snow years in a long time. Could have been a sequel. <laughs> it could have been a sequel. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we are way off track. <laughs> oh, five seconds left of the third period, and the New York Islanders are beating the New York Rangers. Are you That's watching hockey on your laptop over there? No, just the scores. <laughs> Islanders have five, four games now, and they got to win all four because they just won the fifth one. So anyway, I've been an Islander fan since I was a little kid, so yeah. that's not changing. Anyway, <laughs> well, what else are you going to do when you're 
when it's winter, hard water season. You can't go paddling, <laughs> yeah, yeah. so you might as well play hockey. Welcome to Canada, hello. Beauty. Uh, so that's all I've got this week. <laughs> I presume that's all you've got? Anything yes, else? Yes. Are you sure? We're already at 120. I think we're good. 120? 114. 114. 114. <laughs> Once we add in the stuff. <laughs> well, I could keep going. No, no. Or, you know what I could say? If you want to find more about us, you can find us at paddlingadventuresradio.com. We're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. You can download or stream our episodes, iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, iHeart, Radio Player FM, and all your favorite podcast downloading sites. Or you can go to the episode page at paddlingadventuresradio.com, and you can stream or download all our episodes there. 425. Seems like an awful big number. Doesn't it? <laughs> if you enjoy the podcast, please share it with your friends and family and fellow paddlers. I want to thank everybody for listening this week. I'm Sean Rowley. And I'm Derek Specht. We'll see you next time.